Allie. Good afternoon. Welcome to our Fellowship of Christian Church, the 1 p.m. edition. Stress 1 p.m. Afternoon, after you've had lunch, after you've slept in on Sunday, had lunch, and still made it to church. Uh, what a what a great service. <laughs> All right. The uh, title of this is, I Have Come That You May Have Life. Now, this this first... Uh, this first scripture, uh, I've, I've done it in the Message Bible, okay? I don't know if you're familiar with the Message Bible. It's, it's a commentary, okay? Uh, but what I want you to, I want you to more or less hear this in God's words, okay? I want you to hear it like a conversation, all right? You'll understand as you read along. It's, uh, we're going to start with John 10, verses 1 through 10. Let me set, set this before you as plainly as I can. If a person climbs over through the fence of a sheep pen instead of going through the gate, you know he's up to no good. A sheep rustler. The shepherd walks right up to the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate to him, and the sheep recognize his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he gets them all out, he leads them and they follow because they are familiar with his voice. They don't follow a stranger's voice, but will scatter because they aren't used to the sound of it. Jesus told this simple story, but they had no idea what he was talking about. And so he tried again. I'll be explicit then. I am the gate for the sheep. All those others are up to no good. Sheep stealers, every one of them. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Anyone who goes through me will be cared for, will freely go in and out and find pasture. A thief is only here to steal, kill, and destroy. I came so that they might have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Now you understand why I use the message, the way it explains it a little differently. Uh, most people know the story. Um, in our walk with Christ, let me tell you, there are so many things to be aware of that it's mind-boggling. And thank God we don't have to figure them all out in five years. Okay? Because it would be crazy. Um, you know, I was thinking to myself, I've been saved for 40 years this year. Okay, you think by now I'd have it down, you know? Hey, nailed it. Okay, and and it's just not because every time you get there, there moves on you. Okay, you know your goal is to make it over to there, and when you get there, that's not far enough anymore because you have to go over there. And and believe it or not, it it never ends. You never get all the way there. And one time, God, I did a sermon probably 20 years ago. And God said, it's about the journey. I think that was the name of the sermon. It was, it's about the journey. And I thought it sounded really cool. But I didn't understand that it actually is a journey. We are, we are on a, an adventure with God. Okay? And for whatever reason, we have been selected for this journey. We have been selected to succeed. Okay? It, scripture says that we have been chosen to be conformed to his image and likeness. And It's not what we're becoming, it's who we already are. This stuff is really hard to believe and it's hard to understand. You're not going to become any more Jesus tomorrow. You're not going to become any more righteous tomorrow. Okay? You're already there. But it's very difficult for a fleshly mind to comprehend there. And that's why... Without faith, you can't please God. The only way you can comprehend we're there is by faith. Okay? 
It's knowing who you are in Christ by faith. Okay? It has nothing to do with how you feel. You don't feel saved. It has nothing to do with it. In fact, being saved has nothing to do with it. Because this is about discipleship. This is about sonship. This is about doing what God told us to do. Now, Jesus is not coming down to help us, in case you're curious. He sits at the right hand of the Father. The Father said, come and sit at my right hand until I make the earth your footstool. Okay? Well, who do you think is going to subdue the earth? Not the Holy Spirit. Us. The Holy Spirit is training us to subdue the earth and put it under Jesus' feet. That's actually what's taking place. Okay? And, and so we are that generation. We are that generation. Okay? And if you're afraid, the day will come when you're not afraid anymore. If, if you think, I just don't have the skills or the faith, a day will come when you do have the skills and the faith. And you'll wake up one day and you'll be different. You'll be different. Or it'll happen little by little. And six months later, somebody will say, wow, you're amazing these days. And you'll think, yeah, I really am. And after you think about it, you'll realize that over the last six months, you became another new person. And you've gone to a new place. It's been ordained that this will occur. In other words, this is God's plan for every one of your lives. Everyone. This is God's plan. Okay? So when we seek God, let me tell you, you don't have to beg God. That's what he's been waiting for since the moment you were born. He's been waiting for you to say, hey, let's do this. Show me what to do. Okay, we're on it. All you have to do is say those words. You don't have to hear a thing. Because the Holy Spirit will start training you that second. Now, there's no telling what that training will incur. <laughs> and I say it that way. In other words, there'll be really cool stuff, and there'll be really hard stuff. Okay? If you watch The Chosen, when, when, Jesus, uh, when Jesus, when Judas was over talking to, to Jesus, trying to get in on the apostles, okay, to get in on the disciples, Jesus looked at him and he said, can you do hard stuff? And he said, I don't know. I think so. And, and he didn't ask him again. But that was, can you do hard stuff? Okay? That, that's what it's all about. Because who wants to do hard stuff? I don't any more than anybody else. And, and that's why we read books about Watchman Nee and Smith Wigglesworth and T.L. Osborne and Reinhard Bunke. Okay? Those guys did hard things. And we read the stories about them because they did. Okay? Do you know there's a book with your name on it that somebody wants to read? Your testimony. Because you chose to do hard things. Okay? Don't be surprised because these are those days. And you know what? Today isn't a whole lot different than yesterday. Yesterday wasn't a whole lot different than last week. But the day comes when that ends. There's a day that comes when we wake up and it's not going to be the same again when things are going to change. You know what? They're going to change for the better and they're going to change for the worse. Okay? Keep in mind, we are not children of wrath. Okay? It says in Matthew 24 that plagues come upon the earth. Okay? Do you know that we are not subject to those plagues? We are not children of wrath. Okay? You have to remember this when it comes. And that's what you're going to confess. That can't touch me. I am not part of that. Okay? You have to confess it. And, and I believe that this thing that we just went through, that was just a primer. That was a, a, a practice run. Okay? That was a starter. And the next one will be worse. 
And, and just remember, I am not a part of this. Stay away from me and stay away from my household. You have no authority here. Okay? After we meet Christ, changes begin to occur with patterns that lead us away from temptation and sin. You know what? Um, it depends on, on what era of my life it was, but uh, the first couple of weeks were breathtaking. Okay, In fact, the first couple of months were breathtaking. It was like every day was a different miracle. Okay, Let me tell you, I, you know, some people have stories like me where they have, oh my God, God did so many miracles, we couldn't even keep track of them. Okay, We couldn't keep track of them. On Sundays when we would go to church to share testimonies, we had so many that they didn't believe us anymore. Okay? I'm not kidding. We decided no more than three. Three was our max that we would share. So we would each pick our favorite. And that's it. If there were others, we just left them alone. We had one day, we had eight appliances break in one day. Do you, I looked at my then wife Karen and said, do you know what the odds of that are? It's got to be easier to win the lottery than have eight appliances break in one day. I said, this is definitely not of God. We were new Christians, and seven of them were fixed that day. And the eighth one I took apart, and I saw that the AC compressor was burned, and I lost my faith. The others, we're standing there, we have this washing machine, we start doing laundry, and there's water pouring out from under it. So we turn the water off, okay? Something bad is broken underneath, okay? We're talking a lot of water. At least hoses are burst, at least, okay? We prayed over the washing machine in Jesus' name. We command everything to work normally and correctly. No more water leak in Jesus' name, amen. Turn the water back on. We used that washing machine for another year and a half. And, and I was going to look under there, and I bent down. I said, oh, no, oh, no, I am not looking under there. Not a chance. Not a chance. And I didn't look, and I had the faith to believe, and we prayed, and the leak stopped. have no idea where it came from. To this day, I never knew what happened. I didn't care. All I know is I didn't have to get another washer, and I didn't have to fix it. Okay? Not everybody's life is like that. Okay? What God does is God does what you need. Okay? Uh, in other words, I needed all that stuff to believe, okay? Uh, the day my knee got healed, okay? Uh, already the unbelievable has occurred. Who ever heard anybody's knee getting better? Right before surgery, okay? The surgery never happened to this day. 40 years later, no surgery, okay? And the knee works great. And uh, I had a hard enough time believing that. And... and and I was walking around on a leg that didn't work yesterday, and now it does work, okay? You can't exactly talk yourself out of that. And, uh, but not everybody comes to God like that. You know, a lot of people, <laughs> my life was a shambles, okay? So any light was blinding, okay? But for a lot of people, you know, it's just dark. <laughs> it's just dark, okay? So it's harder to see God working, all right? And, and it just depends. But I learned over the years that God does whatever you need. Whatever you need. And, and uh, whatever you need is a carrot on a stick. Do you know that, that thing where you have the, the stick with the carrot on it, and you hold it in front of the horse, and the horse tries to walk to the carrot? Okay? Whatever you need is the carrot, and God holds the stick. And he guides you. If it's money, then there'll be a $100 bill hanging off of that stick, okay? Whatever you need, if it's music lessons, okay? If it's a house, whatever you need hangs off the end of that stick, and you will follow. And, and that, that kind of teaches us which way to go until we figure out which way to go. But as you walk with Christ... Immediately, I found that I, I, 
I thought differently. And you know what? A lot of the sin that I was involved in was because there was nobody there to say, don't do that. What are you thinking? Because I didn't think. You know, I'm 18 years old. I'm lucky my brain works at all. Okay? <laughs> you know, I know how to feed myself and I can drive the car without hurting myself. That's quite an achievement for an 18-year-old boy. And, and uh, so when, when God started all this stuff in my life, I didn't do anything different, but I was different. And what happened to me happened from the inside out. It wasn't anything I learned. It wasn't anything anybody told me. It just came out from inside, and I knew it. I was aware of it. I couldn't comprehend it, though. But what happened to me happened from the inside out. And after a while, you realize that whatever is going on in me, I have nothing to do with. There's someone else here working. Okay? And, and I knew things that I didn't know, and, and I could do things that I had never done. And, and it was just, it was, uh, it was like a daze. It was truly like a daze. I, I had never, never seen a time like that before when God was so in our life. So amazing. I mean, every day was like that. And every day when everybody came home, somebody had a miracle that day. Somebody in the house. It's husband and wife and two kids. There's four of us. And at the end of the day, somebody experienced a miracle, whether it was the kids at school or Karen at work or me at work. Okay? And I, I, could, I could spend the whole rest of the afternoon just telling you miracles I remember. I can't even remember them all. There were so many. I'll be having a conversation with somebody, and they'll say something and go, oh, yeah, yeah, we had a miracle on that. I forgot all about that. That was like 25 years ago. <laughs> and, and it will just pop back into my head. And uh, anyway, we all know the struggle of letting go of the past, but letting go of the past is essential to the first steps in your future. A cup can only be full. If you want to add more, you must first empty some out. And the newness of Jesus in our lives is refreshing to our souls. You have to pour out some of that old stuff so that God can fill it with his new stuff. Topping off the cup, a cup of coffee with some fresh hot brew gives new life to a half a cup of warm coffee. But a fresh cup of coffee is even better when the whole cup is fresh, okay? And I, I wanted to use that as a comparison of letting go of the old stuff. Do you know that pretty much everything before today is irrelevant? doesn't even matter, unless you haven't paid your light bill. That matters. <laughs> the things we give to Christ, he replaces with new stuff, and that new stuff mixes with us and is refreshing and revitalizing to our lives. The more old we can let go of, the more new we can have. So what does this have to do with abundance? The things that are being changed and deleted in our lives have side effects. Most of the time we are unaware of these side effects because we have never known anything else. Example, let us say you like to go to a club. Excitement at the club doesn't get going till after 10, and so you'll have to be there from 9 till 1, 2, or 3. During that time, drinking and drug use are occurring, so it is safe to say that every half hour longer you stay at the club, your chances of a negative incident of any kind increases dramatically. Having friends that live this lifestyle invites the problems that come with that lifestyle into your world. One of the first things I learned, probably in the first year, was I let go of all my troubles. I mean, I quit everything in three months. Everything. I walked away from everything. Okay? We quit watching TV. We got rid of everything. We didn't, want, we didn't 
own a TV for 10 years. Okay? And it went out watching uh, uh, Praise the Lord with Paul Crouch. Okay? And he used to close his show by saying, let every, everything that have breath praise the Lord. And everybody would say, praise the Lord, and the TV burst into flames. This is a true story. <laughs> and we picked it up and carried it out to the curb. It was still on fire when we carried it out to the curb. Okay? And we got the fire out and just left the TV on the curb. We did not own a TV for 10 years. The only TVs, in, there were two TVs in the kids' room to play video games because that was their entertainment because they had no TV. Eventually, we got them a VCR and they were allowed to watch like Bugs Bunny on videotapes, but they weren't. They never watched any regular TV. They didn't even know what was new for Christmas. Okay, Colleen, we come home and her friend was telling her about all this stuff. How come you don't know about this stuff? Well, it's because she didn't have a TV with commercials. She didn't know what was new for Christmas. So anyway, that year she wound up with a Barbie dollhouse. And the next year she wound up with a Barbie RV. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. Everybody had the Barbie dollhouse. Everybody. Um, the precautions that we build into our lives, meaning good choices, lower the chances something bad will happen. Do you know that if bad things happen, they happen between 11 at night and 6 in the morning? Do you know they have? They can say to you on the news that, okay, there's a 26% chance in, in your lifetime that you'll get mugged, okay? Just, I'm making that up, okay? If you never go out between 11 and 6 in the morning, it probably goes to 75% chance that you'll never get mugged. Because the people that do that stuff sleep all day because they've been up all night. Because evil likes to dwell in darkness. Thinking it's unseen. Okay? There's a scripture in the Bible that says that those that get drunk, get drunk in the night. It actually says it. Okay? Who wants to drink in the middle of the afternoon? You know what I mean? There's nobody there. The party doesn't begin till 10. I used to come home and work. Come home from work at 5:30, and I would go to bed, and I would go to bed, and I would sleep till nine o'clock, and then I'd get up, I'd be at the place by 9:30, and we would stay there till three, and then I would go home and sleep three more hours, and get up and go to work, and I do that every day. It was six hours of sleep, and that was all I needed, and I did it in two shifts a day, and so. People thought we didn't work because we were out every night. <laughs> and we had already gone home and went to sleep before dinner. <laughs> Fortunately for me, I had very tough friends. So we didn't really get in any fights because the guys I was with, you wouldn't want to get in a fight with them. Uh, they were farmers. And they were, oh, they were six foot four and 225 pounds of muscle. Okay, they, I don't think they had an ounce of fat on them. Okay, they were so strong, it was unbelievable. They could throw 90-pound bales with one arm. One arm. That's, can you imagine throwing 100 pounds with an arm? Just one arm, all day long. Okay, so nobody got in a fight with them. So I was with them. <laughs> I'm with them. Yeah, go away. <laughs> and and uh, also wisdom helps. Wisdom helps. Um, <sighs> precautions we build into our lives, meaning good choices, lower the chances that something bad will happen. Also, where there is trouble, there is darkness and unclean spirits that go with them. Do you know that when you go into a dark place, you can have stuff follow you home? You have to remember they're not looking for the people they already have. They're looking for the people they don't have. So when they see you, it's like a brand new fresh hamburger. Okay, I, I want you to understand this. So if you go to a place where it's dark, don't be surprised. Let me tell you, when you go to your car, you pray over yourself. I release every assignment against me in Jesus' name, and 
If there's anything trying to follow me at home, don't even think about it. Get lost. Okay? It only takes a second, but remember to remember to pray for yourself if you wind up in some place where it's dark. Or let's say you go to the bus station. Okay? Can you imagine if you could see in the spirit what the bus station would look like? Wow. Wow. Okay? Uh, if you're a spirit looking to follow somebody, that's a good place to start. Okay? But you could probably say that about a lot of places. Anyway, you get the idea. Once you walk away from bad choices and the people associated with these problems, the new will begin to fill you up. Don't think you are abandoning your friends and family. You must secure the ground. We must secure the ground we have before we can help clear someone else's land. You are opening the door to heaven and holding the door open for them. You can't be with them in that world and hold open the door also. Okay? And um, at that time in my life, we, we abandoned all our friends. We just, we just quit calling. And once in a while, we would have to go out for dinner or something just to, oh, we love you, we haven't forgotten you, we've just been busy, and, and actually we were just staying away from you. Okay, and we started hanging around just people in church. Those are the only people we hung around with. Our life changed so fast, so dramatically. I'm telling you, it was it was just insane. It was crazy. I mean, our life was filled with trouble, filled with problems. We had an apartment in California. We li lived in regular apartment. Okay, so we made dinner, and we washed all the dishes. And, and put them in the drain board. Did some other stuff. By then the dishes were dry. We put all the dishes up in the cabinet. We went down into the bedroom. We were changing the sheets. And I heard dishes rattling. And I said, do you hear that? And she said, yeah. Sounds like there's somebody in the kitchen. The kitchen is only from here to that wall. It's only 20 feet away. We're in an apartment. And we went back out there. And all the dishes are back in the drain board. Happened every night. Happened every night. As soon as we go down the hall, the dishes would be back in the drain board. And I, I don't know, it's creepy to me. Okay, I knew it was some kind of spirits, but obviously they can't kill us or we'd already be dead. Okay? And, and uh, I, I finally met a guy at work that knew a little bit about it. And, and he said, those are unclean spirits and they're, they're sent to... To kill, steal, or destroy. I, you know, at the time, I had never heard that phrase. Okay? And, and he said, they, they are trying to, to ruin your life. And he said, but you can get rid of them. He said, they don't have any authority that you don't give them. All you have to do is say, get out of my house and don't come back. And he said, they're done. And we went home and did that. never happened again. Okay? And, and that was someone from a, a different religion. <laughs> And, and so the, the principles are all the same. I mean, we didn't know anything. Uh, so all of this was, my whole life was an adventure, okay? I can remember being, I can remember being eight years old and coming home from the movies on a, on a Friday night. It was probably 9.30. I went to like the 7 o'clock showing, and it's 9.30. I'm eight years old. You could still walk around town. You were never in any danger back then. You know, at, at, we didn't even lock the door of the house. And so I'm coming home, and the house before me had a big yard we used to play in, but between their yard and the sidewalk was a picker bush. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, with the little red berries, okay, those sticker bushes that your mother said, don't eat those berries, <laughs> okay? And, and I stopped there, and I remember I looked up into the sky. I, I, can, I tell you, I can see it right now like I was standing there. And I said, you know, I belong up there, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. Really, at eight years old, I, I, I told Rhonda, if, if they called me up and said, look, we got a one-way ticket to Mars. You interested? I'd be packing in 30 seconds. You could come with me or not. We're going. <laughs> okay? I, I, was, I was born to go out there. I can't explain it to you, but my whole, all my insides say, you're going. 
I, some way, one way or another, I will be out there. I figure it's after the Lord returns. Okay? But I always knew I was a part of something from there. I always knew. As an eight-year-old kid, I knew it. But you don't tell anybody because what you're saying doesn't make any sense in your own head. You know what I mean? What do you mean you're going out there? You know, at eight years old, it's, uh, I'm, what, 1961? Okay? I don't even know if they had rocket ships back then. They hadn't invented them yet. They were still working on them. You know what I mean? They just didn't have much stuff. But what I'm trying to tell you is that God has been working in your heart your whole life. And as you seek him, you will discover that he was always there. Okay? The time you fell off your bike and you thought you hit your head and you got up and you were okay. Okay? Uh, we were playing chase in, the, in a big parking lot at, at night. Okay? And uh, I was up. You know, uh, back then, that the stores, the parking lot was down there, about six feet down, and you'd have to go up the stairs, and there was a landing, and then that was the back of the stores, okay? We were playing chase, and I was, I was running, and I went to run across the roof of a car, okay? And I slipped. I'm standing on top of the roof, not the hood, the roof. And I fell down, and I hit the asphalt head first, right here. When I hit it, I thought, oh, my God, you killed yourself. I'm not kidding. I hit so hard that my eyes didn't even work, okay? And I just laid there, okay? I just laid there because I was, I was afraid to move, okay? And I opened my eyes, and I could see. And I thought, well, at least I'm not dead, okay? This is about the, I was probably 12 at this time. And I got up, and there was absolutely Nothing wrong with me. Okay? And we just continued to play. And I said, I recommend you don't run across the roof of the car. <laughs> because the dew had settled and they were slippery. Okay? We weren't worried about the roof of their car. We just, you know, didn't want to fall. <laughs> but you, you see what I'm saying? In other words, I can look back and God was there. God was there. I should not have gotten out of that unscathed. My, I mean, I fell... The roof of a car back then, you know, is this high. It's got to be at least four feet. And I'm three feet, four feet taller. So I hit my head from eight feet up. Okay? And my feet were behind me. I hit head first, right on my forehead. Okay? Let me tell you, even at that age, I knew that you can't do that and not be hurt. And I just thought I was lucky. Man, I'm lucky. All right? Anyway. Uh, I have a dent in the top of my head where we were roller skating and we took our skates off and we were out running around in the parking lot and I ran into a steel bar, a pipe. You know, they have the pipe, you know, where, the, the, where you go in the entrance and I was running and I just happened to put my head down and hit that pipe and I, I cracked my skull. I never went to the doctor. I never had a concussion. I didn't have anything happen to me. I went home. My mother yelled at me. She looked at my head and said, ah, you'll be fine. And I was. Okay? So many things. That isn't all that happened. Okay? That isn't all. Uh, when, you, when you grow up without a dad, the, the rules are different. Mom, mom can't keep track of five boys. She can try, but it's not hard to pull one over on her. Okay? She's got her own life to live. She's got to cook meals. She's got to do your laundry. Okay? And she has five boys to look after. Good luck. Okay? So we, we pretty much ran her ragging. Uh, she was lucky if she knew who was home <laughs> at any given time. And, and yet she took care of all of us. God was with me my whole life. It, it took years to figure it out. And I just figured I was lucky. I knew that I had escaped things. Okay? And I just thought I was lucky. I didn't understand God, but I knew he was there. I knew he was there. I didn't, I didn't really grasp it. You know what I mean? I knew it, but I didn't know it. It's hard to even explain. Anyway, you get the idea. The point is, he's in your life the same way. God is with you the same way. 
Okay? 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 21. So, from now on, we regard no one with, from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, and the old has gone, and the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, so there it is. Our first job is to help reconcile people to Christ. Okay? In order to do that, you have to know the Word. You have to know the Word, and you have to deal with your soul. People cannot get you angry and aggravated and push you over the edge because the devil will do it every time, and you'll be ineffective in all that you do. You have to get over yourself. Okay? That's your big goal. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making the, his appeal through us. Okay? Delegated authority. That's what Sam talked about last night. Or uh, Daniel talked about it this morning. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Verse 16 explains that we must make a choice to change our thinking and act on it. We must speak of ourselves from the new person's point of view so faith can do its work. Let me tell you, this is life-changing stuff. This will change you forever. Matthew 10, verses 26 through 31. So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill your body but cannot kill your soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. Now, I want you to see in there that you can't die before God says okay. Okay? Now, it says that we can only live to be 120. I beg to differ. You will live as long as Daddy says you're going to live. Okay? Okay? That's at the end of the day. What that also means is, you know, somewhere over in Katy, okay, up in Hitchcock or whatever, there's a deer running around in the woods. That deer can't die until the father says, okay. Nothing can die on this earth that the father doesn't first say, okay, because... He is the source of life. He gives life, and he's the only one that can release it. Nothing else. Nothing else. That These are amazing things. Amazing things, okay? Y you know, I have a, a joke that I do. I started about 25 years ago, and I said, keep busy for God, you'll live longer. <laughs> make, make yourself worthwhile. <laughs> Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid you are worth more than many sparrows. Okay, this is a lot of talking. Jesus is explaining that we are more valuable to God than all the things of the earth. Even the death of everything is in his hands, in the hands of the Father. The great I am isn't called almighty for nothing. Through Jesus, we have forgiveness and eternal life. The catalyst of all of this is faith in Christ. Faith in Christ sets all of this in motion. Using faith like a tool or a gift from God, we are able to believe and see our lives changed permanently and forever. We eventually come to the revelation that Jesus really is who he says he is. And if we learn to speak the word in our lives and avoid negative remarks, 
Watch what we say in obedience to the Lord and the, and the word will produce prosperity and peace as a side effect. The walk with Jesus is easier and harder than you think. The gospel of peace is simple. Forgive and walk in forgiveness without judgment and love one another. <laughs> These are the foundation stones upon which a Christian life is built. Then there is the doing of the same qualities, and that's where the trouble lies. Doing is difficult because, one, I don't want to, or two, I don't seem to know how to do these things. Paul said, I do what I don't want to do, and what I don't want to do, I do. And that pretty much says it all. There are forces at work in my life that are unseen and unknown, and they have influence in my life. In my estimation, the only way to dig through all the learning and experiences in my life to root out the bad can only be done by the Holy Spirit. You must be persistent in this endeavor to succeed by calling and talking to the Holy Spirit on an almost daily basis. If this seems a bit extreme or excessive, Look around and count the number of people who are the image of Jesus in their words and deeds. Ask the Holy Spirit to heal your mind, will, and emotions and correct and, and learn or, or correcting and learning or teachings that are not correct. Ask Him also to heal your broken heart and renew a right spirit within you. Don't try to decide if this applies to you because it does. And even all of us, to some degree, have it. Let God guide you. My final statement is we are new creations in Christ, and I believe it, and I accept the Holy Spirit intervention in my life. Say that right now. Go ahead. In Christ. And I believe and I accept the Holy Spirit intervention in my life. Do you know that the Holy Spirit can't work in your life unless you ask Him and permit Him? He will not usurp your authority. Okay? You have to give God authority. So, <laughs> I'll tell you one, for, one more funny story. Okay? Uh, I was... Uh, <laughs> God said He wanted me to do something. And I said, uh, I don't want to do that. He said, well, well, I want you to do that. And I said, well, I don't want to do that. And he said, uh, wait, you're, you're misunderstanding me. He said, you already gave me permission to do anything in your life that I wanted to. So I'm really not asking you. I was just being polite. Okay? He said, but you will do it. And I said, I never gave you any permission like that. He said, oh, yeah. You remember that day you were walking around praying and you were in the dining room laying on the floor and you had your feet up under the table and you said, Lord, I'll do anything for you? And I said, no. And he said, liar. <laughs> liar. <laughs> and and it, it was just a funny exchange. It was just a funny exchange. But let me tell you, if if you dig into God with both hands, let me tell you, he will make himself visible in your life. You won't wonder if he's there. You'll wonder how come everybody else doesn't see what you see. Okay? And you know what? On Sunday, you won't be able to share all your testimonies because you'll take all the time up. That's what it's like. That's what it's like if you live that life and walk that way. And it's just, it's learning the word. It's praying, it's spending time with God, it's being kind to people when there's no reason to. It's, it's not being you, it's being Him. You know what I mean? It's don't be Howard, be God. Be Jesus, okay? And when you, when you begin to act like that, the things that happen to Him begin to happen to you. And and you'll accidentally pray for somebody in Walmart, and 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 they're healed in like two seconds. Okay, so so fast that you're surprised. 
okay? And you were just walking around and you saw somebody in a chair and you say, well, God bless them. And then the lady looks at you and gets up, okay? That's what will happen. That's what he did, okay? Um, when you have the word of the Lord, you got the word of the Lord. And, and all the gifts of the Spirit will work through you, all of them. Forget one. You'll have all of them. You won't use them all at the same time. But if you need healing, you'll have it. If you need the prophetic, you'll have it. If you need discernment, you'll have it. Okay? The price is pretty high. Okay? And, and your soul doesn't like it a lot of times. Eventually, your soul will shut up. Eventually. Okay? And, and the thing is, you just... It's like learning how to ride a bike. Okay? You know what? Everybody rides a bike... It doesn't matter how long mom holds on to the back, okay? Sooner or later, you're going to fall, okay? But the more you fall, the less the, you, you realize that, okay, well, there'll be no more falling here, okay? I used to ride down the end of the street. I didn't know how to use brakes, so I would run into a tree, okay? I used a tree to stop. I mean, you just brace because you're in whack, I'll hit that tree, okay? Lucky I had a little bike with big, fat tires, okay? That's what saved me, but I learned to use the brake. But I fell in that picker bush I told you about earlier. Yeah, okay, I didn't fall into it twice, I can tell you that. You know how when you get there, you go, oh my God, don't fall into it, and then you fall into it? Yeah, yeah, I did that. And uh, in other words, if you actually try to do this, if you actually pray these prayers and say, okay, Lord, yeah, let's do that, all right? Let me tell you, once you say yes, it's yes, and, and there's no taking it back. You cannot take it back. You cannot undo what you do. Just be aware of this. Scripture says count the cost. Okay? And, uh, but I'll also tell you you'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. Because the person you become, you'll look in the mirror and cry. Because you become so much better than you knew you were. And you had nothing to do with it. Okay? I, I, one of the coolest stories, one of the coolest things, I, I, I some a guy asked me. <laughs> he said, "Can you prove that Jesus is who He says He is?" And I said, "Yes. Look at me. Yeah, I am the proof. Okay." And uh, I said, "If you don't believe me, I'll find you somebody who knew me 20 years ago, and they can tell you who I was back then." Okay, and. Uh, I don't know if they said it in The Chosen, but uh, uh, long ago we decided that uh, whatever whatever happened to me wasn't me. You know, in other words, um, <laughs> Watchman Nee used to say, if you see any good in me, it's not me, it's Christ. Okay? And it was like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's it. Okay? If there's any good thing that comes from me, it's him. And so, thank you those who are watching today. Uh, God bless you. Um, thank you those from Louisiana <laughs> and, and other places that are donating to the ministry. Uh, it's it's uh, welcome. Thank you. And uh, uh, we're going to lift up your friends in prayer today after we're done here. So, uh, be blessed, and thank you those for viewing. Amen.